Got it. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Northshire Presents virtual event. Uh, my name is Daweth Wood. I'm the events manager at Northshire's Manchester location, and I'm here, as so often, with my good friend and colleague, Rachel Person from Northshire's Saratoga Springs location. Um, as you saw coming in, we are recording this event for perpetuity on our YouTube channel, um, but don't worry about it. Only those of us who are unmuted and in this yellow box will be um, recorded on there. So if you have any questions at any point, please type them in the chat and Rachel and I will save those up and we'll ask them and we'll pose them during the Q&A. Finally, we expect all participants to maintain an atmosphere of respect and fairness. Anyone who violates the standard of behavior, including engaging in any form of harassment, may, at the discretion of our organizers, be immediately removed. Um, so thank you so much. Um, tonight, I get to be the one to introduce Steve Schenken who is here to celebrate the release of his new book, Fallout. Steve is a three-time National Book Award finalist and received a Newbery Honor for his book, Bomb. He is my favorite children's book author, but I am entirely biased because I also happen to be married to him. Um, because of that, I was hugely proud to read today that book page called Fallout, his new book, the work of a nonfiction master at his best. Steve will be interviewed tonight by Christina Soonturnbot, who writes award-winning fiction and nonfiction for young people. This year, she received not one, but two Newbery Honors, which is incredible. I don't know of anyone who's ever done that before. Um, one for her novel, A Wish in the Dark, and the other for her nonfiction book, All 13, The Incredible Cave Rescue of the Thai Boys Soccer Team. Please join me in welcoming them both to North Carolina Presents. Uh, thank you, thank Rachel. You. Thank <laughs> you for that very nice introduction. Hi, Steve. Hey, Christina. It's good to <laughs> sort of see you. This is the best we can do at this point, but this is, um, thank you for doing this with me. Of course, of course. I'm so honored to be here. You know, um, all 13, the, the nonfiction about the Thai cave rescue, that was my first nonfiction. And I tell people all the time that I use your books and, and your text as mentor text. So I think you're you're kind of like the nonfiction. It's, it's just like the review that Rachel that Rachel read out, the nonfiction master. So uh, this is just such a treat for me to be able to grill you and ask you all these hard questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That's very, very nice. I mean, it's, it's, so good, yeah. you know how it is. You work on something for a long time and then you're basically done a year before it comes out. And so I've been, I've been reading, like sl slipping through the book and making sure it holds up. <laughs> yeah, to remind you. <laughs> yeah, but it's pretty fresh. I got it. I think I got it. I think I can handle the question. I think I okay, can. great. Yes, I, I won't ask you any like stumpers or anything like that. And don't ask me because I, I, I'll, I'll, I haven't read through my book in a long time either. But I just to start off, because there may be some people who are joining who don't know, would you tell us what Fallout is yeah. about? I happen to have one right here, actually. Um, it's a uh, yeah, the cover is cool. And you, as you know, you don't always have very much control over the covers, but um, I think that was, that's what I was going for. And it leads into the question perfectly because I was going for a Cold War thriller. And, and when you think of that, you normally might think of uh, James Bond or John Le Carre, or, you know, you think of fic adult fiction, but, and I wanted to use some of those techniques, but I knew this was gonna be middle grade nonfiction um, set during the Cold War. And so that's the, the essence of it. And it really is sort of a companion to a book I wrote called Bomb, which was set during World War II. And that was about the making of the atomic bomb and all the spying that went on in the Manhattan Project by the Soviets. And so this kind of picks up that story in the Cold War, but with uh, some of the same science spying, international intrigue and showdowns, all that kind of stuff that I really like to write about. And so during the Manhattan Project, scientists realized we're making this, this kind of bomb or trying to based on splitting atoms. But they realized just as soon as they started to think about it that they could do something even, I, I don't hesitate to say better, but something more powerful. They realized they could fuse atoms too if that they could create enough heat and pressure they could fuse hydrogen atoms, which is what happens inside stars. 
And they didn't have time to figure that out, which is probably for the best. But the idea was there and it was something any scientist at that level would, would have thought of. And so that happened just as soon as, as the Cold War began after World War II, both American and Soviet scientists started thinking about what they called the super, the super bomb. And they both figured it out pretty quickly and started building them. And that's the timeline of my story. So I pick up in the early 50s when both countries have figured out how to build hydrogen bombs. And so then the main question becomes, all right, well, human beings are smart enough to pack the power of the stars inside a bomb, but they're also smart enough not to ever use them, right? You know, and that becomes the timeline of the story because that's really what the 50s into the very early 60s was all about. And I really focus on this one really short, incredible time period in the early 1960s. And sometimes it's good. One of the history can be both frustrating and maddening, but you can sometimes find some comfort in thinking and seeing that we've gotten through other times before. And even though the news today seems so dramatic and often so dark, that uh, it's not unique. And so in this one period of time, just it just blows me away all the things that happened just in this little storyline that I'm talking about. From the middle of 1960, you had an American U-2 plane shot down over Russia. Just a huge story, which really just blew up relations between the US and the Soviet Union at that time. And then the election of eight, 1960, where uh, Kennedy Nixon, very, very, contentious, talk about a divisive election. Um, Nikita Khrushchev interest, interestingly would later claim that he meddled in the election and cast, he claimed to have cast the deciding vote in the election of 1960. And this is, you could make a case that he certainly, he certainly tried to. Um, one, one of my favorite things about the book is how you make Nikita Khrushchev come alive. Like, oh, that's good. I want to get into more of that. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I want to get back to that because that was probably the most important. I mean, in, in a classic sense, he's the villain in the story, but I wanted, you know, like you would do in a novel too, you, you need your villain to be more than just a cartoon. He has to be multidimensional and scary, but also a real, hopefully a real person. And yeah, and so I worked really hard on that. But yeah, just, I mean, just to continue what I was saying that, that it takes it through those, er that, those years of crisis, the Bay of Pigs and, Yuri Gagarin's space flight took place in the same week. Can you imagine if there was 24 hour media and TV news that, you know, the cable news would have, their head would have exploded if that had existed. And Kennedy meets Khrushchev in Vienna soon after that, really feels bullied by, by Khrushchev. Then the Berlin Wall goes up right after that. And then that leads almost really quickly into the Cuban Missile Crisis. And that all took place in two years. And so that's really the focus of fallout with an emphasis on trying to create using these big events that we all want students to know about but trying to turn it into what feels like a, a spy thriller yeah and I, that, I, that's I think it totally has that feeling it it okay. definitely has that feeling and actually like the the opening of the book is very cinematic like it feels like a like a spy movie <laughs> um yes. Yeah, so okay. I was going to ask you, I, I want to ask you about the beginning. Okay, I'll just ask you now. What, how, did, how did you decide, how do you decide where to start? I, I love beginnings, and, and um, I think the beginning of, of All 13 is awesome. Um, Christina's book about the Thai cave rescue, and you do, there's like a few different things you can do. Your book has a kind of a thrillery feel to it, too. Even though it's a true story and we think we all know it, you managed to create all this tension. And I feel like one of the ways you can do that is just by putting these characters into a situation and then you sort of building that, that sense of dread that they go into the cave and they think that the rainy season hasn't begun yet. But then just at the end of the chapter, you let us know that maybe that's not true. And, and uh, yeah, I wanted that kind of feeling. And I feel like there's a lot of ways to, to try it. And, and I wish I had a better answer than just trial and error. I don't know if you, if you do that or, or or did that with your either fiction or nonfiction, but I had so many different scenes. At first I thought, well, obviously I'll just start with Gary Powers, the YouTube pilot. He's in the cockpit of his plane, 70,000 feet over the Soviet Union and the tail of his plane gets shot off, you know, and he's going down. And that's just, that's very cinematic, that would work. But then 
And this is such a big challenge with nonfiction. Well, I'd have to stop at some point and go back really pretty far back in time to get to that stuff in the 50s that I wanted to talk about. And so that I tried that and I wrote a lot of that stuff and I used some of it when it came up, you know, about 50 pages into the book and some of it just didn't make it. And so I just tried a lot of different things and hit upon, sometimes you do know it when you see it, hopefully. And I hit upon this story of a paper boy in Brooklyn in 1953. And that was perfect because it was a kid, you know, a 12, 13 year old kid delivering newspapers. Everyone can sort of relate to that and picture it. And he's walking up the stairs of a Brooklyn apartment building to two retired teachers on the top floor and collects the money from them in his hand. And as he turns to head down this dark stairwell, he drops the coins. He had gotten 50 cents in, in nickels and dimes and dropped them down the stairwell. And they're bouncing and pinging and spinning. And, and one of them, the nickel splits open. And as he gathers it up, he realizes this nickel has split open and inside is a tiny piece of film which he holds up to this faint light coming in through a dirty window. And it has little groups of numbers, five digit numbers on it. It looks like something out of a spy movie. And it is, except it's real. And this, he, he didn't know of course, right away that this is some Soviet spy ring, but the thought had cro crossed his mind just because it was the fifties and that was it, that was part of, American culture and the things that Americans worried about at that time. And he ran home to his dad. It sets off just a great scene. I hope Steven Spielberg is watching because I think yeah. he would do a good job. I, at, I was going to say the same thing. Scene is it, just very like his, that kind of style of, of cinema. It would work perfectly. He runs home, dad, look what I found. Oh, Sanji, I don't know what that, what that is. Maybe you better show, you know, the police. And he actually had a friend who was, who was in school Whose, whose dad was a cop and he went to her apartment. But the guy wasn't home and he said, oh, I'll just forget it then, I'll just go play some stickball. You know, she has all these elements of things that you would make up if you had to, but you don't have to. And when the dad came home and, and the daughter said, yeah, some, this kid Jimmy from my class came by and he found this hollow nickel with some kind of secret message inside, but you weren't home, so he just left. <laughs> and then the dad scoured this neighborhood in Brooklyn looking for a red haired kid, you know, playing, in the street and eventually found him and demanded the nickel and that just made for a perfect opening because it's a self-contained you know three page scene which is great it happens at the right time for my timeline and and it makes you ask a lot of questions like well what what is what was on that piece of film did he stumble into a russian spy ring why what are the why are the russians spying on us what's going on and and it was just a perfect entry to to all of those things but I tried a lot of different <laughs> scenes before that, some of which made it and some didn't even make it into the book. That, that's good to know. I'm glad that you had to suffer too. You gotta like, suffer. You have to suffer like the rest of us when you're writing your books. And yet, <laughs> do, do you find easy. this, like, you know, when you're writing the first draft or the first version of an opening, you know it's not gonna make it. And yet yeah. you have to believe in it while you're writing or, yeah, you or what chance do you have, right? Do you, do, you, do you feel that dilemma as you're writing? Yeah, I feel like I just have to get past that. Like, oh. it's just so daunting to start writing anyway. I just have to like get past it and know I'm gonna come back and figure it out later. I mean, same, I, I thought about also like start starting my book when um, the boys were found and then backtracking but it just didn't feel right. It just felt like kind of um, gimmicky or something. I felt like I just wanted to st start off like getting to know the boys. It, and it's like, you're right. When you find it, the rhythm of it and the mm -hmm. feel, it's like the atmosphere. Um, yes. It just has like the right, creates the right mood. So yeah, like, like in, in your book, it feels like ominous but at the same time it's like normal life a, a paper boy going around his normal life but all of this dark ominous stuff is happening in the background which just made it perfect oh good yeah that, that was <laughs> um i felt i mean it's nonfiction, so you need a lot of the same elements you would have in a novel but you can't make them up and so uh, that's sometimes you feel just very lucky when you find something like that yeah, totally. Um, so did you, 
when you finished bomb did you know you were going to write another book like the next the next stage of the cold war or no. did this sit with you for a long time like what you took a long time between these two books so why what yeah bomb came out in 2012 so i definitely wasn't thinking about that at the time and, and to me, the fun part of the job is skipping around. You know, before Bomb, I did a book about Benedict Arnold. After that, I did a civil rights story. And, and so it's just, I love the, the skipping around part of it. And I didn't think, I always have in the back of my mind, spy stories, thrillers, some sort of, you know, nonfiction page turner. I try to, I'm just always looking for stories like that. Although that's the other funny thing is that you can never actively look for a story. Or at least I've never found one that way. It's always been an offhand remark by somebody, a time I was reading just for fun, you know, nothing, never, never just going into work and saying, today I'm going to find a great story that people don't really know about. So I was just, you know, take going where these stories led me, going to civil rights, to the Pentagon Papers, to, you know, the Carlisle Indian football team to women pilots in the 1920s. And, and there's a, there is in a weird way, a logical progression only because the research in one thing led to some discovery that I'd never thought of before. And it was only after that last one, Born to Fly, that I just started thinking around. And I go through this, this, these lists that I just keep all the time. I wonder if you do that too, just do you have lists of potential stories, things you might do one day. And sometimes the idea can, you can put it down there and it can seem, eh, that's just an idea. And then maybe two years later, it just, it suddenly seems like a really good idea or a really terrible idea. <laughs> yes. And I'd had this idea for doing a, something that I knew would lead to the Cuban Missile Crisis. But I didn't want to just write a book about that. I just, that just felt too limited and too, it wasn't what I, what I wanted to do. And so I couldn't figure out how to do it. And so it just kept going back in the notebook and back in the notebook until I did some more research and realized there was a much bigger story there with, with such interesting characters, including Nikita Khrushchev, who's really in, he's the one person who's in the story right from the beginning to the end. Yeah, when I was reading, I was imagining him as, um, oh, what's the guy's name from Minions, the villain? Yeah, 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 that's probably <laughs> not, Coincidental, and I think the Bond, you know, Bond villains have sort of been based uh -huh. on, on a caricature of him, for sure, no doubt. Um, okay, so I I have had this question uh, that I have wanted to ask you, and we've done other events, and I haven't gotten to ask you this, but um, when I was reading the book, I was think. First of all, I I just realized I didn't really know a lot about this history, like. Bay of Pigs, Cold War, you know, it, I think if you didn't live through that time, it's something that you hear about and you think you know it and you don't put it all together. Like, for example, how short the timeline was and how how rapidly things escalated and how close we got to another world war with with nuclear weapons um, and just like the feeling of fear and everything that, that I kind of understood better, like, you know, my parents talking about that. Um, but it just made me wonder like, okay, Steve, after he worked on this book, do you feel like better about the world right now? Or do you feel like we're all doomed? I, I mean, I, I feel like, like, you know, I could go either way when I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, usually reading about history makes me feel better. Not in a positive way, just because you realize, wow, that was, those times were just really terrible. And you realize, yeah. <laughs> I think if you gave most, as, as hard as things are right now, if you gave most people throughout history, I'd love to figure out a way to do this poll. I don't know if you could without time machines, but where, where and when would you like to live? And I think most people would pick, pick now, in spite of all our, of all our problems. So there's that, um, but yeah, this story, what, what, there's so many different versions, just even focusing in on the missile crisis and how close we came, even people were, who were there have different opinions about how close we came. But what, what I zeroed in on, and it's very, to me, disturbing, is how much luck was involved. Because I feel like you had two very level-headed leaders in Kennedy and Khrushchev, and, and they both went into this crisis 
instigated. I mean, really their moves and counter moves are what caused it, but they also knew in their minds, we're not gonna let this get out of hand. It's not worth fighting over with the weapons that we have now, except they just kept escalating and kept escalating and assuming at some point somebody was gonna back down. And it's only in retrospect that you realize there were all these things that were really out of their control. And whereas neither one of them would have consciously pushed the button, as we say, that it almost doesn't matter because it could have happened so many other ways. And at one point I even say, if you, if I, if you read about some of these things in a fictional book, you'd probably throw the book across the room and say that could never happen. Yeah. And yet it did all these mistakes. The Soviets, Soviet rocket scientists set a probe to Mars in the middle of the crisis, they apparently weren't watching the news. You know, they weren't really following what was going on. And Amer of course, American radar picked up a rocket and only after doing some calculations and it blew up in the atmosphere, which didn't help because it didn't look like missiles coming, you know, over the, the North Pole toward America. And only after doing some calculations did they realize that it wasn't. Of course, that set off all kinds of alarms. Like we had a U-2 flight that was had nothing to do with what was going on. It was just going to collect air samples. And, and, and the guy got lost and uh, flew over Soviet territory in the middle of the crisis. So they just, the, they in turn see this American plane coming over the border and all these little, not little things, but that made, made us realize really only in retrospect that, wow, some of these, so many of these things could have been misinterpreted and could have led to escalations from which there couldn't have been the possibility of backing down. The biggest one, and I think to me, the most dramatic moment in the whole story is the Soviet submarines, which were in and around the Caribbean outside of Cuban waters with nuclear torpedoes. And the US had no idea. The US knew that the ships were there. We were, had really good, these hunter killer groups are really good at tracking submarines. But they knew these kind of Soviet subs didn't carry nuclear weapons, except they did this time. And the guys had explicit orders to use them if they were going down, if they were attacked. And sure enough, the Americans did attack the subs because that's what you do when you, when you find a submarine there, you, you try to force it to come to the surface. And the, the, a couple of the subs came really, really close to firing these weapons. And if that had happened and they'd blown up a fleet of US Navy ships, how, at that point, does Kennedy even have the option at that, of backing down? I don't think so. It's all, that, now we're getting into speculative, but not very far into it. And you realize, wow, it was, in that case, there was one Soviet commander who stayed really level-headed. And people have called him in retrospect, the man who saved the world. I don't think that's so far-fetched. And so there were these, that's, what, that's what's disturbing to me. It's these little moments that were out of that were either stupid, unlucky, um, or some little known, relatively oh. unpowerful person stepped forward and saved the day. And all yeah, these or like just... like that that bomb that they dropped in the United States on accident. Where was that? In yeah, we dropped a, a hydrogen bombs on North Carolina once by accident. Yeah, that and was they right they like could two get days me. after Kennedy took office. Yeah. <laughs> and it just didn't have one of them came really close to igniting but uh, it didn't like <laughs> i just landed in a field somewhere but yeah there's there yeah. there are disturbing numbers of those kinds of stories too that was crazy yeah that uh, you know after researching the cave rescue i had um this realization like when you watch the news and when or when you go back and read about historical events the people who are involved seem like you know like they are the leaders. They're the people in charge, and like they know everything, and and you're way outside of it. But one thing I realized about researching was like they're just regular people, and sometimes you know they're just winging it, and they yeah. don't know exactly. You know, they have to make a split decision, and sometimes it's the right one, and sometimes it's not. And not not to say that like people are not heroes. There are definitely heroes, but it just it just made me it kind of demystified the people who take part in history, you know? And I, I, I that's the same. I think idea. that's so important and true. And, and, and I, that was one of the biggest focuses for my research was to find out what it was like to be in those rooms 
it's also very thrillery. That's just a classic setup. All right, let's decide what to do next. And you know, there's a bunch of people in a room, and they're looking at a map and making decisions. And and with in Kennedy's case, during the missile crisis, he was secretly recording. We think of Nixon doing this, which he did. But Kennedy had a little switch under his desk in the cabinet room that he could flip on to start recording everybody. <laughs> and only Bobby Kennedy knew about it, nobody else. And so we have, and now the, the beauty of the internet, especially in 20, if you happen to be researching a book in 2020 when you can't travel, all that stuff is online now. You can listen to these meetings and get as close as you can get it to being in those rooms and, and seeing the tension and attempts at humor and the people who clearly did, didn't like each other, or didn't respect each other. Kennedy really butted heads with some of the military guys. And then with the on the Soviet side, it's a little harder. I mean, you don't have that same resource, but there's there's some, there's some really good accounts of what happened in those meetings as well. And the thing I hit upon in research, I'm sure this has happened with you too, is something you just have to know more about. And it's just not there. It's not, you know, it's not there in the book. And and what in this case, what it was was that there were mentions in, in Khrushchev's own writings and in others that he he lived in Moscow, of course, and at night he would go for walks with his son, who was in his 20s. He still lived at home. And and they would go for walks together at night and they would have these confidential conversations where Khrushchev could try out ideas and and gripe and and moan about the situation, but also just be open in a way that he didn't feel he necessarily could be in those Politburo meetings. And I thought, my God, what a what a resource. I mean, those scenes would be, and any movie would love to have those scenes. And of course I can't make up dialogue for them, although it would be wonderful to be able to do that. Father and son walking, it's already beginning to snow in Moscow in October now. And what I realized through my research was that his son, Sergei, was still alive. That he had, and not only that, but he lived in the US. So he had he had moved to the US in the 1990s, I think, and, and worked as a professor a little bit and was retired and living in Rhode Island. And so through some kind of nerdy detective work, I was able to get his phone number. And that kind of thing makes me really nervous making calls. Uh, this is, I encourage, I always, tell students these kind of stories because I encourage like anyone can do this kind of stuff. I've talked to lots of people like this and they've never ever known who I was. So it's not like they said, oh yes, I love your books. They just <laughs> you just find out how to contact them. And in this case, um this I I the insight was well I'm never going to be able to just find it. he's in his 80s like he doesn't have Twitter or anything. Not that people at that age couldn't but he just didn't. And but the Gary Powers, the YouTube pilot who was shot down over Russia. His son wrote a book about that incident, which was a, bit, a big part of my research. And the son had Sergei Khrushchev write the forward to his book, which was pretty recent. And so I was able to contact Powers Jr. And he was very, very nice and helpful. And he actually sent, he was the one who sent me the, the phone number. And mm -hmm. so that was, that was a highlight of my research life to be able to make that call and ask what it was like, you know, what what those walks were like. And I even said to him, you were a participant in history, you're not, a, not an observer. And he was very humble about that. He said, no, 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 I was just there. I was kind of a sounding board. I wasn't affecting events or anything, but I'm not so sure about that because this was the one, these are the one, the one person he could really talk to. Wow. Including during the, the height of the crisis. And so that was just gold to be able to, like you say, to get to know him, it's not like Sergei, you know, 50 years after the fact, it's not like he told me something that I was never going to find anywhere else, but he helped me get to know the people so that they're not just these distant characters in a book. But I felt a little bit more confident when I described Nikita's personality and how what he was thinking and what he wanted, what he wanted from the moves that he was making at this time. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree that when you talk to someone and they tell you the story, like even if you're not using their words verbatim, that just makes all the difference. It's yeah. just the same thing when I when I met the boys who had been trapped yes. in the cave, even though we couldn't really speak because I don't speak Thai very well and um, most of them didn't speak English. It just made all the difference to like portraying them as real people. 
So that's so crazy. I can't believe you got his number and just called him. It's also weird to me that people pick up the phone. <laughs> yeah, I don't was... think I pick up the phone for like an unknown number. I never do that. So that's this amazing. Is an old school phone. Yeah, old school phone call too. Just hear hello. And the other line. <laughs> I just better launch into who I am. And what... I think Gary mentioned it to him, I think, because he seemed to have some idea what I was talking about. You know, like I, the hardest person that I've ever re tried to reach was Daniel Ellsberg when I was doing the Pentagon Papers story. And he had no idea who I was and virtually hung up on me the first couple of times that I called. <laughs> and, and, and if you, it's kind of a bad idea to lead with, um, I write children's books because then he's thinking, well, what do you mean like that? They, I think they picture a picture book. It's like, that's yeah, not really. Like a board, like a board book. Yeah, I have to talk to CNN. <laughs> I can't talk to you. <laughs> And, uh, uh, so. Wait, do you find that because I it's, I feel like some people are actually more there was someone I interviewed who hardly gave any interviews, but he talked to me because he knew uh, I was writing for kids. And was so, that for all 13? Yeah, it was Vern Unsworth, the caver. He oh, yeah. he um and he was so important. He was like clutch interview because he knew the cave. Um, but I guess he felt like, you know, I wasn't going to sensationalize it and and he wanted kids to have the accurate story so that's good actually yeah that's that's good yeah that part of the story is amazing these guys who were i mean scuba diving so much can already go wrong i took a scuba class in college <laughs> and, and basically the whole class was each day they would just tell you about a different way you could die yeah <laughs> that was the whole class and then we and now let's go to the pool <laughs> and, yeah uh, but and then if you do it in a, in the dark in a cave, I mean, oh my God, that was so dangerous what they did. I know that's crazy. That's just that's a whole other type of person. Yes, that is <laughs> amazing. So did you? How did you get in touch with him? Is it? Uh, did, did... I got in touch with him by uh, there was actually there's a, a man in Austin who is a um, a caver and he. Um, like invented some cave diving equipment. So he he's an explorer and he his whole thing is he tries to go to the deepest underground caverns, like break world records. Um, oh and and he happens to live in Austin and he said that I could come out and interview him. And it just ha happened that he knew everyone involved in the cave rescue because it's such a small world. Like cave diving, yeah, yeah. everyone knows each other because it's just, there's not a lot of people who are crazy enough to do it, I guess. So he actually gave him, uh, gave me his email. Um, yeah. and he, that sort of introduction, like, you know, like with you. Yeah, you everyone know, in the Cold War knew each other, apparently. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> These guys, yeah. Um, yeah, wait, and so what? were there things that you uncovered? There had to have been so much stuff that you weren't able to put in the book. But is yeah, you know, I actually checked. I do these little, um, I do cuts files. I want to hear how you do this. I'd love to hear this, but uh, it's just a word file. There's no organization to it. And I just call it by whatever, whatever I call the book, which I thought at the time I was, I called it super just because it was like the super. Oh, yeah. Nobody liked that title, but <laughs> no, that title was called super cuts, which I think is a trademark name of <laughs> <Yeah>. a, <laughs> a barbershop chain or something. But Super cuts. I just looked in super cuts. It's 338 pages. Oh my God. 62,339 words. Now, oh. that's not literally things that I wrote and then cut out. Some of it is stuff that I cut and then reused in a different form or used some of, but a lot of it is there are stories that I just couldn't fit in. And, and, and that hurts. It just hurts. And again, you, you can't know that when you're writing it because you have to put your heart into, into the scene. And only later you might realize, oh man, I can't use that. And yeah. you have to cut it. I, I wrote enough. This could have been an opening scene in some versions of the story, though not a middle grade story. This would be a great opening scene. 1959, there was a, a company, a bomb shelter company had a contest where a newlywed couple would stay in one of their shelters for two weeks. And if they stayed in there for the whole time, they would win. Uh, actual honeymoon in Mexico <laughs> and Gosh. so all these couples sent in their you know their applications and they picked this young couple this great looking there's great pictures of them this great looking young couple from Miami and and they did it 
And it was, of course, a media circus, a reality show, you know, before people thought there were reality shows, because they were there for two weeks. And they did a wedding on the lawn. They're in their tuxedo and white gown. And then they go into a hole in the ground, just straight out of uh, some dystopian movie and, and spend two weeks down there. And, but it was also kind of a farce because they had a phone line and, and the, you know, like the, the one of their mother kept calling and asking how they were doing down there. And they, you know, it was terrible. It was really hot and uncomfortable. And uh, they, they forgot a can opener which was a problem because all their, all, everything was just canned food. So it didn't exactly go to plan, but they made it through the two weeks and came out and they were, you know, the guy had a beard and they were all sweaty and dirty. And it's just a great little story. And you could tell it in one page really. And I just thought, that's just a great, I'm going to fit that in. If it's not an opening, it's just going to, I know that's going to go in there because it illustrates this kind of fallout shelter culture that I want to be a part of the story where it's kind of funny, but it's also really creepy too. Yeah. And I just wrote it and wrote, I did so much research. I was so excited to find articles about the event and find the pictures of them. And, and then I just couldn't figure out where to put it because it just was a timeline thing. You know, I start mm -hmm. with this incident with the paper boy, and then I want to move really, really quickly to the death of Stalin and, and Khrushchev winning this power struggle in Moscow to take over the Soviet Union, and then really quickly to the U2 story, mm -hmm. which really is what ignites and propels the main action of the story forward. And I thought that kind of takes place right between those key elements of Khrushchev rising to power and both sides building these super bombs. And then the U2 incident, which begins with a great moment of the, the of the of this young Air Force pilot being recruited into this very secret program that I really wanted to emphasize. And I just thought it's, it's slowing, slowing things down, even though it's not slow, it's still slowing down the action of the story. And it took me a very long time to admit that to myself. My wonderful ed ed editor, Connie Shu, has worked with me on it. And sometimes she'll tell me right out this, this too, this is, this doesn't belong. And sometimes she'll kind of let me figure it out, which great editors, I think, like to do that sometimes. Yes, they're so sneaky. Say, yeah, I'm not sure <laughs> about this. And do, do you have, I mean, have you had that experience where you've just sort of known you yeah. had to cut something, but it still took you a while to admit it to yourself? Yes. And I, I, f I feel like now I, I, like once I, once I sort of get that inkling, I'm just like, I just know this is going to go. Yeah. <laughs> like, you, you just can't, you can't fight it anymore. I but, mean, um, yeah. That, well, you have, there, there's like a newlywed, the um, Gary Powers and his wife, there's yeah, just see, a newlywed, they're not in a bomb shelter, but. Exactly. And that, that and I wanted been, to emphasize that. that so, yeah. 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 They were in, that couple was in quarantine. That's like a COVID quarantine. But they had to do it in a bomb shelter. That's, That's terrible. True. Two weeks. And it was two weeks was, was relevant because they figured in these incredibly creepy cartoons that the government would put out for civil defense, how to, how to survive a nuclear blast. And, uh, you know, they said, yeah, two weeks should be long enough that the worst of the fallout should be on the ground by then. So you should be able to come out. So good luck. Two weeks. Oh. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Can you even imagine? Um, Fran Lebowitz, she I've seen her do like a really funny bit about about that and being like, I, I just don't I don't want to I don't want to come out and be she was like, I don't want to be with you people. I you I, I don't want to be stuck with you people at the end of the world. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just funny. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I I have more questions for you. I know, you know, we have people in the audience. If if folks have questions, please do get ready for them. Get ready to ask Steve. You can type them in the chat. Um, I mean, I have more, but I don't want to monopolize all of Steve's time for sure. Um, I I definitely I I absolutely want to know what your working on next and like i know you say that you have to like kind of stumble on something but how do you decide what is going to come next and like what where you're gonna start looking so you can stumble on something great 
Um, I think oh. I, I'm sort of in that that mode where like I'm working on lots of things. I'm not working on any long nonfiction right now. And I'm kind of like, oh, I'm open. I'm just open to the universe, but I, I just don't really know where to go. So like, how, how do you decide like what you're going to read, what you're going to watch and pay attention to? Yeah, I know that feeling so, so well. And I, and I get really frustrated by it. You seem like you're pretty chill about it. And it, it's good to have have other things to be working on but I said I start I start trying to force it and that just doesn't work at all the only thing that works for me is just to keep to read the things that I'm interested in it's it's the only time I ever really believe in supernatural elements because there are sometimes there's a book that's on the, been on the shelf for 20 years and I said you know I've always maybe I'll read that now and it has something in it that I needed to to know about at this time that will lead to another line of inquiry that will lead to a good story. And, and, and that's always how it works. But like you, in the meantime, I have lots of other things I'm working on. And one of the things, I mean, it's, this is a really a full circle thing because when my brother and I were kids together sharing our bunk bed, all we ever wanted to do was make movies. And, and so, and we tried for a while in Austin, actually, <laughs> in, um, in the nineties, we tried to make our version of low budget movies without too much success, though it was a good experience. And now what I find is really fun is to turn um, a book into a graphic novel, which I'm doing for Bomb. And that is just like writing a screenplay. It's like taking what's there and turning it into scenes. And now I can finally write the dialogue. You know, when I get Oppenheimer and Leslie grows into a room, I could write the stuff that I always dreamed of being able to and create those scenes. And so that's being illustrated now. My work on that is really done. And I, and I did a picture book as well, which I never thought I would do, but this was just something that that actually my my older sister's longtime partner told me a story and he's an artist and, and, and it was just, it was a full blown picture book. It was just, he didn't know that yet because he, he never thought about illustrating a picture book, but he told me this story about his mother growing up in the North of Japan during World War II. And it was just, the images were just, they lived on a tiny island with a lighthouse wow in uh, 1945 and, and yeah so that's in the works and so it's good to have a bunch of things while you're on that bigger quest i find um for for, for the big thing yeah what when's your when's the graphic novel coming it's still a year or so away i think uh -huh. hopefully you'll start hearing about it within that next year because i've seen i mean i've seen the art those take forever to make and i understand i mean 300 pages of comics it takes a long time yeah, it's going to be worth it. The art is just incredible. Oh, that's I have a, a graphic novel in the works, too. But oh, it's, great. it's a memoir. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's great, about great. Grow, it's about growing up in seventh grade. I tried out for cheerleader for middle school cheerleader. And it's the saga of, of trying out. Oh, for man, that's cheerleader. a winner. Yeah, so is that so it's, done it, with it the is nonfiction, but, you know, it's memoir. Very different. <laughs> That's good. That's a, yeah, that's but good. yes, it's so much like writing a script. It's yeah. so different yeah. from writing um, anything else, and different from writing a picture book too. It's been really totally it's been a good challenge. Yeah, I actually really love it. Oh, your publicist says bomb graphic novel is twenty twenty three. Yay! Don't you love having your publicist no, <laughs> right I, there so they can? <laughs> that is good. Like, early twenty. I hope she's at early twenty three. <laughs> and those dates always seem like oh, that's so far away, and yet we know. It's really not. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, Connie has a question for you. She was wondering if you found out why Khrushchev's son moved to the U.S. in Rhode Island. Yes. Well, I mean, why did he move to the U.S.? That I don't know. I mean, I think he he wanted to live in the United States. He he had just wanted wanted the, to live the life here. He had grown up in the Soviet Union. He became a rocket scientist in the Soviet Union. He had a successful career. And I just think he wanted to enjoy the freedom in the U.S. and, and had opportunities to, to lecture at universities. He worked at Brown for a number of years, uh, which must be the, have led him to Rhode Island, I guess. But yeah, and he, he, he wrote extensively about his dad, his father, as he calls him. And so I think that's what brought him to the States. He became a citizen wow. in, in the, at some point in, the, I think, the late 90s, which is sort of also an interesting addition to the story when you think about what his father was trying to do. I mean, really, what his father was trying to do was win the Cold War. 
that he's always quoted as saying, we will bury you. And I, and I believe him when he says, I, I didn't mean that literally, although it might come to that. He really meant our system is, is going to win out over your system. He was a true believer. And yet his son became a US citizen. That an interesting comment on how that turned out. Yeah, totally. Um, who's your favorite person you've ever interviewed? Oh, is it wow. him? You think it's him? I should have, I didn't, was, I know, I, I should have like let you think about that. Sorry. I mean, the one I was most involved in, um, in terms of research, I mean, interviews and that I relied on the most was definitely my, the Daniel Ellsberg for my book, Most Dangerous. In, in, terms of, in terms of research stories that I found, the most meaningful one to, my, to me still is, is, is Robert Allen, an academic in, in California who wrote the, who did all the research on the Port Chicago story, these young black sailors who stood up against segregation in World War II, and he tracked them down in the 70s and did interviews with them, which I couldn't do because they weren't alive anymore. Mm -hmm. But he sh he shared those with me, and I got to know him, and and that to me still is the greatest research triumph of of my working life because those stories I just couldn't I could never have written anything worthwhile without getting access to their words. And that just didn't exist in any library or anywhere except in a box in this, in this man's apartment. Wow, yeah, no, that's amazing. And, it, and how old was he when you interviewed him? Robert, he's still, he's, he was about retirement age. He was a professor okay. at Berkeley for many years. And uh, okay. yeah, I still talk to him now. Oh, that, that's awesome, that's amazing. Um, Lori Martin has a comment. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, Lori. And, and, and Rachel, am I doing your job? Are you supposed to come you on? You are, but you're doing it wonderfully. So if you want to keep doing it, you're welcome to. If you want Davith and I to take over the audience questions, we can do that too. Like whatever works for you. We're, we're happy to, to let you do it if you want to, but we can also handle them. Okay. Uh, well, I'll just keep going and just show me when to be quiet. Um, Lori says that she's a huge non narrative nonfiction fan. Christina or Steve, or maybe a co-authorship. Ooh, cool. Yes. I like that. <laughs> I'm so interested in something that incorporates this recent pandemic oh, and yeah, possibly major diseases of the past 50 years in the US and on an international level, Legionnaire's disease, polio, maybe something about measles, anything from the two of you would be wonderful. Oh, that's a cool, that's a cool idea. Oh, I definitely like the collaboration idea. Yeah, the number one question I used to get, at least over the last few years in schools was, are you going to write about Donald Trump? And I always said, no, I, I just have, once he's gone, I, I don't want to remember that he was ever there, you know? <laughs> and. Uh, and that would be the end of it. And so I don't know. I mean, actually, the, before that, for years and years and years, the number one question I got was, when are you going to write about 9-11? Uh -huh. And I don't know, do you get that one? It's yeah. interesting but from, from, from middle school kids who, you know, now and for, for years now, have, weren't, haven't even been alive during the time, weren't alive when that, when that happened. And they know it changed the world in some way, but they're not exactly sure how. And and even that felt too recent to me. So I don't know. Now it's been 20 years. Well, I don't know, are you think, have you thought at all about that? Like writing about something? About writing the pandemic? about the pandemic? Or, I or haven't. I, I, I have thought that it would be so fascinating to interview the people who worked on the vaccines. Yes. Because it's just such a uh, accelerated timeline. Um, and, you know, like really just such a triumph of science that they came out so quickly. Um, like that would be amazing. I, I, that's as far as I got being like, God, I think, what I think about the that? pandemic is I think it's actually helped me understand history a little better because I always, you always wonder, you know, what was it like? What was it like to live in whatever time, the great depression? Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of a good analogy to today. And you thought, wow, people must have been just uh, thinking about the Great Depression 24 hours a day. And you realize, probably not, you know, li like living through this period, it, yes, there are dark moments and scary times. And we've all had relatives who have been involved, you know, affected by this. And, but most days are just, you adjust to it and you mostly do what you have to do on that day. And I feel like that gives me a little bit of insight into what it might have been like to live during these other times in history. Yeah, no, that is interesting. I was thinking about 
it the other day and um I have a, an eight-year-old daughter and I think for kids her age the way like um so like the way that I look back on World War II and like think about it so far in the past like it was such long ago history is yeah. the same time span of the 80s for them <laughs> between now and the 80s it's like world they're like that's how far in the past it is which like to me it was just like ancient so ancient history it's kind of depressing that actually. is funny actually yeah that is funny <laughs> um let's see what well, we're getting some other uh, comments here oh about 9 11 children there was a question from sam i'm um, a little ways back in the chat if i can cut in yes. i'm asking if you have more sessions of author fan face off planned and you should tell everyone who doesn't oh, know it, what author fan face off is thanks sam i didn't set him up for that yeah <laughs> author fan face off is my very nerdy book game show where i get together one awesome author and one fan i do it with a great um, school librarian Stacy Ratner, who's probably out here somewhere, right, Stacy? Okay, good. And yeah, we get together a great author like Christina, who's done an episode, and a fan, and they just they go head to head on questions from a book. And in her, in Christina's case, we did all thirteen. And so it's the kids usually win because they're such huge fans of the books that they study them, and the authors haven't read them often in a couple of years, which is awesome. But it's just a chance. It was our kind of pandemic pivot. It was a great chance to to try and do something that would be fun for kids and teachers during last school year and we are going to continue it i'll put the i'll put a link in the in the chat so people can check it out and and so yeah we're thinking of of authors that we want to sign up we're um we're recording an episode with shannon hale this week so that'll be the next one that's that's the first time i've ever that's unknown breaking news right there so we are continuing yes thank you sam for mentioning that <laughs> oh, Sam says they did the author fan face off with you and Candace Fleming. Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, that's Sam. Yes. In Missouri. Right? <laughs> I understand well. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I, I kind of feel bad because I actually like studied my book beforehand because I'm so competitive and I did yes. not let the kid win. Like, and then after I was like, why didn't I, why did I do that? Like, I should have oh, let them you win. You had a challenger from <laughs> Singapore, right? And she was really good. She, no, she was great, but I was, was like, really knowledgeable. I'm sorry. I, I just can't <laughs> lose. I just, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I lost. I did one too. I lost. I <laughs> kind of an honor. I felt it was an honor. To, to yes, me. totally. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> um, well, what, how about reading? What are you reading right now? Are you reading yeah. nonfiction that we should be read all should be reading? And I'm reading nonfiction that we're all should read. Or, any, I, I, or I, fiction or anything. I treat, I mean, for, for, I try to, I love to read fiction that kind of relates to the nonfiction that I'm writing. And so for a really long time, I was reading all kinds of Cold War uh, thrillers and mysteries. And that's the kind of thing that, that I just love to read. I've never, I mean, I've never read a John Le Carre novel. Oh, you I think I need to. Yeah, you should. And, and um, shame. Yeah, you should. You should. But I, I mean, to me, reading is just like writing. I just love to skip around from, um, I still love, I love to read graphic novels and comics to, to, I've been just reading a lot of World War II kind of really atmospheric mystery stories lately. Mm -hmm. Um, Alan first. Mm. I got that name right, right? Rachel shaking her head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's awesome. Reads, if you like a really atmospheric, like pre World War II, everything's about to go horribly wrong, but these are like really romantic, tense spy stories set in that world, right? Of the late 1930s. I've really been into those lately. Well, that sounds good. Um, I, I just finished, uh, I've been reading lots of graphic novels and I just finished The Best We Could Do by T. Bowie. I don't, I don't know if I said I know it, that one, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a memoir about her, it's like a family memoir, the story of her family coming to the United I mean, yes. States from uh, Vietnam. Gosh, that was amazing. So much history, but like from one family's perspective and it was so good. It was very heartbreaking, but also hopeful at the same yes. time. Yeah, I was and I was reading it as, you know, everything in Afghanistan is unfolding and, you know, they her her family like barely got out um, out of Vietnam and 
So same sort of like history repeating itself. And yeah, that was very similar. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, no, no, we're go close ahead. to out of time, but I thought I could ask a last question of both of you to sort of wrap up with, um, which is Steve, you mentioned earlier your notebook with many ideas. And I know for a fact that in your notebook, there are stories that you, for one reason or another, are probably never going to get to tell. And I'm guessing, Christina, that you might have some stories too that you've sort of thought about and wound up not being able to share with the world. And I wondered if each of you could tell one of your favorites mm that you're probably not going to write and, and why you love it and maybe why you're not writing it? Oh my god! That's a good question. I can go first to, to buy you some time because I, okay, I just thanks. had one that I've been thinking about lately. What, what I have my latest version of my notebook. I don't think it's in here, but it's one of those stories I keep coming back to all the time and it would make a good graphic novel. So maybe I could do it there. But um, if you ever want to learn more about it, just, just um, type in to a search the Great Diamond Hoax. And it's this story from the Wild West where these two scam artists claim to have found a diamond mine in Colorado and they started selling shares of this non-existent diamond mine in San Francisco. And it just has all the elements of a classic scam story, but set in the gold rush, California. So that in crazy atmosphere, the Continental Railroad, Transcontinental Railroad had just been completed and it's just got so many elements of a great story, but it was just, but what it didn't have is just what we were talking about, which was characters that I could get to know. Oh, yeah. There were these two scam guys, brilliant from Kentucky, but we just don't know anything much more than their names and the, a basic outline of what they did and, and no real way to put them in scenes where we know, have any idea what they said. And so I, that's one of the ones that's in every notebook because I always find a little something new and put it in there and think, like, oh man, I'd love to do something with that. Uh, yeah, I would love for you to do that too. Just figure out a way to do that. Okay? Yeah, I know, Wild West, fascinating. true crime. I mean, come on, it's a winner. <laughs> but maybe if, if I could make stuff up, it would work. So maybe it's a graphic novel. Yeah, there you go. That's just, that's solved, problem solved. Problem solved. You've got your next project. Yeah. Um, for So for mine, I guess I, I just remembered, I one of the movies stories that really shaped shaped me as a young person for good and bad was uh anna and the king of siam so the king and i yeah. that, when i was growing up that was one of the only media depictions of thailand that i that that was ever on screen and there's you know there's like there's things about it that are so beautiful that I love so much, but there's also like so many stereotypes and inaccuracies and things like that. So I, I have, uh, you know, read books about that actual woman. She, it's, a, you know, based on a true story, this woman who goes to Thailand and, and tutors the king of Thailand's children. And so I have thought about writing like a true story or maybe just historical fiction about that. And the thing that keeps stopping me is there are some pretty hefty um rules and laws in thailand about writing and depicting the royal family so you can actually oh. you can get into a lot of trouble like you can go to you can go to prison for depicting them in a non-flattering way so you know that kind of holds me back a little bit <laughs> that is but what a winner talk about a story that just yeah you just get it right away that would be great yeah if you can figure and, out how to do it and it could be fiction but then again you may even in fiction you would run into that that same problem? I don't know. It, it just, it's enough to like kind of put you off, you know, it's, if you could write scary. about yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. Like... If you want to be able to travel and, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great idea though. Great. Great idea. Good question, Rachel. Okay. We'll keep, we'll keep thinking about these. Yeah. These exactly. That's your homework <laughs> it is to keep thinking about how to make those two books amazing. Cause I, I would love to read both of them. Um, we are sadly out of time, but this has been such an incredible pleasure hearing the two of you speak. Um, Christina and Steve, thank you so much for taking the time. Audience, you can order both of their fabulous books from us at northshire.com or from your own local independent bookseller, wherever you are. Um, thank you so much for your support of Northshire Books for tonight and for being here tonight. And you can visit us at northshire.com to learn about more great events coming up. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks. Thanks so, Thanks so much. much, Christina. Thanks, Thanks Rachel everybody. and Davis. <laughs> See you guys later. Great. Congrats, Steve. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hope to see you, you out in the real world someday. Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs>